So listener Ian has found the perfect new game for you. Oh yes, what is it? So you know in the past you've spoken about the fact that you like games that feel like work. You know, like you like Truck Simulator and Factorio, they're like work games. Yeah, they're work simulator games in my mind. Well, we found the ultimate CGP Grey work simulator. It's called YouTuber's Life. YouTuber's Life is the ultimate life simulation tycoon video game in which you become the world's greatest video blogger in history. Edit videos, expand the amount of fans, and turn yourself into a wealthy fellow. Uh, that sounds horrible. Did you play? <laughs> so work imitates life, imitates work, imitates life. That's a, little, that's a little too close to home. The screenshots are amazing because they show a bedroom with an unmade bed and somebody working on a computer. Remarkably, by total coincidence... I watched PewDiePie do a playthrough of YouTube Simulator just yesterday. Oh, really? <laughs> it showed up in that here's what YouTube thinks you should watch section. They were really right, though, right? Like <laughs> that, Sometimes that YouTube thing freaks me out because they're like, oh, yeah, no, I would like to see that video. Thank you so much, YouTube. <laughs> All right. Well, this, this one struck me as particularly funny because it's, it's, I am not subscribed to PewDiePie. I have probably watched fewer than five maybe ten of his videos ever hmm. and hmm. but but youtube just knows right their little algorithms their data algorithms simply know hey uh we're going to suggest you a pewdiepie video that you cannot possibly resist on clicking and they were correct and i clicked it and i watched it and they were right it was a very entertaining video <laughs> what do you think of uh youtuber's life i will never play a game like that it looks <laughs> It looks terrible. It looks like the kind of work simulator that I hate, which is not really a work simulator. It's just the game randomly rewarding you at times with stuff. I don't know. I, I, I have no interest in ever playing that game, but I can recommend PewDiePie's video where he plays that game. <laughs> He's very good. He's very funny. And he turns it into a bizarre meta commentary on his own life as a YouTuber. So, of course, he ends up making a little character that looks just like him. And he just makes all of these comments about feeding the machine and got to keep it going. There's a, there's a reason that guy's the number one YouTuber. I wouldn't watch all his videos. They're not all for me. But anybody who thinks he's just an idiot playing video games in his room, like, you don't understand what this man is doing. You don't understand what he's doing. When we talk about that talent thing, and when we were talking about a long time ago about having that spark, and we used MKBHD as a, an example of that from his first video. Right, right. Little little tiny 12-year-old MKBHD. Yeah. PewDiePie doesn't really have a spark. He has a fire. Yeah. Like, that man, there is, there is no doubt. Absolutely no doubt. Whether you don't like his videos or not, you cannot deny that they are well-made. Yeah, that they are well-made and that he is just engaging uh -huh. he's engaging in this way that is difficult to describe yep uh, <laughs> but yeah so really youtube algorithms you know you know what i wanted even when i didn't know what i wanted and then what i wanted was watching the number one youtuber play a youtube simulation game this is an episode out of time indeed it is mike because from my perspective this is insanity, because I just spoke to you yesterday. Mm -hmm. We we just did an episode yesterday. We did our cortex anniversary episode yep. yesterday for people who are uh, interested in the cortex annuity of the show. I'm so proud of you right now. <laughs> You're really getting into this. <laughs> and this episode, you are probably listening to sometime in July... Maybe August? I don't even know when this is going to happen. So people will be listening to this at some point in the late summer, mm -hmm. months after we are recording it. Yep. So this is what will be past me talking to you uh, after what is intended to be a very long, very busy, very unusual summer for me, which is part of the reason why we are recording this well ahead of time. But it makes the verb usage here seem very strange. Like, like in the future, I will have had done things that we will certainly have had already talked about on yep. shows we will record. But from the perspective of people listening, we've already recorded and they have already listened to. Because it's very confusing. Because in theory, now, looking to the future... So mm -hmm. people can judge our predictions. We have 
participated in RelayCon together. Right. We will have been to RelayCon. You have been to VidCon. I will have been to VidCon. We will have recorded our first in-person episode of Cortex. That's right as well. And now we are approaching the second annual Cortexmas. It's all very confusing. It is all very confusing. And the very fact that I am going to RelayCon and the very fact that I'm going to VidCon are things that I have stated publicly nowhere at this stage. (laughs) Which is what makes it all the more exciting to mention. (laughs) It's like a fun little secret Uh uh, at this moment. (laughs) I I may not even mention anything about being at VidCon until after I have left. I don't know. We'll have to see. You, listener, will already know if I did or didn't. Yep. (laughs) But that might be a, a surprise. So, yeah, it's it's just it's a strange thing, but we are trying to plan in advance for what is going to be a a busy summer. So the reason we are recording this is because there's going to be just a ton of stuff going on. And I know that later in the summer, uh, in addition to all of this crazy business stuff, I also have a, a ton of family stuff that I'm doing later in the summer. Mm-hmm. So this very morning for this episode, I was actually tallying up what is the theoretical number of flights that I am taking this summer? And uh, I haven't bought them yet. There's a, there's a few events and a few things that are still a bit uncertain. But I will be taking no fewer than eight and no more Ooh. than 14 flights this summer. Wow, that's a lot. Uh, oh, my yeah. word. Yeah, I know. It is it is quite a lot. But that is why uh, a little while ago I said, Mike, we need to, we need to talk about the summer cortex schedule. And that is why this episode is happening right now. Also, because me and you have been through something like this already. So last year, you were away for a lot of the summer, Mm -hmm. and we didn't prepare for it, and it was a nightmare. Yeah, last summer summer was a bit of a disaster in very Mm -hmm. many ways for me. Probably one of the biggest ways was that somehow, I don't really know how, but you convinced me not only were we going to launch Cortex last summer, but we were also going to be doing weekly episodes, mm-hmm. which was insanity. I don't know how you convinced me of this. I don't know why past me would have agreed to such a thing. Uh, but that was way, way too many episodes to be doing at once. But we tried. And then we had to try and squeeze it into a schedule. And you were on standby flights, arriving at weird days. It was, <laughs> it was a nightmare. So we also, we have learned together in our working together over the last year or so, and we are now recording an episode out of time. Yes. And that is what this episode is. But there is an interesting lesson in there, I think, be- about the whole idea of this thing existing, is mm-hmm. that we are collaborating better now than we have before. Because we now understand the habits and patterns of each other, and we are working to respect those. So, <laughs> I know that you'll be traveling, and you know that I'll want an episode. Right. What, what, what Mike is trying to say here, listeners, <laughs> is that we respect it. Mike knows that I want a bunch of time off this summer, <laughs> and I know that Mike wants a bunch of episodes this summer. <laughs> we have these mutually incompatible desires. And so we have compromised on one cortex miss. So there was going to be one fewer episode of Cortex this summer. And also doing this episode in advance. So this this is the thing. This is the compromise that we have come to. This is another one of those CEO to CEO discussions that we had that we've mentioned in the past, which, mm-hmm. again, I will underscore the importance of anybody who is self-employed working with other self-employed people that it is very, very useful to be able to have these conversations. So useful. So useful. And we were able to come to an agreement because I wanted more episodes than we're doing and you wanted more time off than you have. So right. <laughs> we came to a compromise. Uh huh. Yes, we did come to a compromise because, as we may discuss later in the episode, in theory, I would just like the whole summer off. I would like the whole summer off too, but <laughs> then I can't eat. Right? That's not how it works. <laughs> right. But that's what I mean, right? Is, is, is there are all of these various constraints and things in life. I do also just want to, again, reiterate your point to anybody listening who is self employed and works with other people. I, I really think if you can try to introduce the the explicit language like again we will say like we are talking 
CEO to CEO now. Like, do that as a mode shift when you're having business conversations with someone. It is hard to express how much easier and clearer that makes things. Uh, it it really, really does. I, I highly, highly recommend anybody working with other people. Like, try to do that. Try to institute that as, as a company culture in both of your companies. Uh, it's extraordinarily beneficial and just makes things much, much easier. But yeah, so in addition to this being a bit of a negotiation between the two of us, this is also uh, one of these cases for me where it's important to know yourself and... I found myself as this summer was approaching really constantly thinking back towards last summer and just realizing how last summer was a bit of a disaster across all fronts. Uh, Like this summer, I had a bunch of family responsibilities and I also had a bunch of work responsibilities. So there was Cortex. There's also the Hello Internet podcast. There's also the YouTube videos that I did. There's some other business stuff uh, and also a bunch of family things and Last summer, I just did a frankly terrible job of trying to manage all of those things. And as a result, I had a kind of grumpy summer. Like I felt that I was not doing necessarily really great with a lot of the business side of things. And then I also felt that I wasn't doing really great with a lot of the family responsibilities. Like it was just torn between these two different worlds and not being able to give either the the time and the mental energy that they required. And so I think this is this is such an important skill in life is to be able to look on a thing, objectively evaluate yourself on it to recognize, oh, I didn't do very well last summer with these kinds of things, and then think forward to the future about what are the structural changes that can be done to improve this situation. And so Reducing the number of Cortex episodes by one and also doing one in advance like we're doing now. Like that is one thing that is definitely happening. And I'm doing a similar thing with Hello Internet. I think one, maybe two. I still have to finalize it. But there's going to be a few fewer episodes than would otherwise be normal over the course of the year during the summer. And I'm also making a conscious decision like I do most summers to intentionally do one fewer video than in theory would come out over the same three month span if I was working at another point in the year. And I feel like this is one of those times where, well, I have a bunch of things to do. This summer in particular is going to be filled with a huge amount of social time and family time. Like I always find that very energy intensive And so I am not like last year going to think, oh, I can just truck through this like normal. I'm just I'm just going to keep doing all the amount of work that I normally do. And I'm also going to have all of these other responsibilities and everything is going to be fine. It's like, no, no, I'm going to learn from last year's experience and intentionally turn down the work dial so that hopefully the whole of the summer goes more smoothly than it did last time. This episode of Cortex is brought to you by Casper, the company focused on sleep that has created the one perfect mattress that it sells directly to you, the consumer. Casper have revolutionized the mattress industry by cutting the cost of dealing with resellers and showrooms, passing those savings directly to you and eliminating those commission-driven inflated prices. Casper, as well as their award-winning in-house developed mattress they now offer adaptive pillows and soft breathable sheets as well casper's in-house team of engineers spent thousands of hours developing the casper mattress which has a sleek design and is delivered in an impossibly small box it is obsessively engineered at a shockingly fair price it combines springy latex and supportive memory foam to create a mattress that's got just the right sink and just the right bounce plus its breathable design helps you to regulate your temperature throughout the night buying a casper mattress is completely risk-free they offer free delivery and free returns to the u.s and canada with a 100 night home trial if you don't love it they'll pick it up and refund you everything because casper truly understands the importance of sleeping on a mattress before you commit to spending a third of your life on it Mattresses often cost well over $1,500, but Casper mattresses cost $500 for a twin size, $600 for a twin XL, $750 for a full, $850 for a queen, and 
$50 for a king and they're made in America. But you can get $50 towards any mattress purchase by visiting casper.com slash cortex and using the code cortex. Terms and conditions apply. Thank you so much to Casper for their support of this show. In the balance of all of that is time off, right? Mm. Um, Understanding that you should be putting your efforts into the right places, one of those places should be time off. Because if you work in a company, you'll get time off. And you get time off because there's a very good reason, because everybody needs breaks, right? And in more traditional companies, everybody takes it, and it's all done. And like in the company that I worked at, you had to. Right, it mm-hmm. wasn't even a, a joke. Like this was just a thing you had to do, and one of those breaks had to be two weeks. Mm-hmm. Right, they were like all things that were like you had to do them. And I know in a lot more kind of new companies these days, there are like these trends which, on the face of it, seem quite good, but actually work out to not be too great. Like unlimited vacation time. Are you familiar with this? <laughs> oh man, I I love I love unlimited vacation time at companies because this to me is is the embodiment of corporate evil. Yep. Uh, (laughs) So uh, for listeners who may be unaware, this is a trend, I feel like, over the past few years of companies saying there is an unlimited amount of vacation time for you to take. You take as much as you feel that you need because we, the company, we love you and we want you to be happy. And it sounds great, and I think especially for people walking out of university and into their first job. Like, oh, this sounds like an amazing bonus. But the end result is that without knowing how much vacation time is okay to take, that people who work at companies that give unlimited vacation time essentially take no vacation time. That they they never take time off. Because everybody has this paranoid feeling about how much time is appropriate to take off? When is it okay? I don't understand what the boundaries are. And so, yeah, it's just, it's total total corporate evil to do that kind of thing but it is very important to make sure that you do it and that like unlimited vacation time in a strange way is exactly the way that me and you live our lives in and um, with so many self-employed people right it's like i can take as much time off as i want because i make i call the shots but what happens is i take none right yeah so i am i have become better and better maybe in the last year about taking some breaks but one of the things that i do which is good and bad is a lot of those breaks have some kind of work component in them Mm -hmm. but that helps me justify a lot of it to myself and you know i'm definitely not working as much as usual in those scenarios Mm -hmm. um but there is more relaxation time occurring than usual (laughs) as i was laughing before because the comparison between unlimited vacation time companies and self-employment is just is perfectly spot on and again in the in the thinking about my upcoming summer which will have passed by the time people are listening to this and thinking about my last summer that's gone on and thinking about just how i spend my working time i am so very much aware that in the past two years this is also an area that i have been just very bad at is taking time off and I recognize that as one of these things that I want to try to improve and I want to try to get better at. But it is in no small part because there is a bit of a lull, this feeling of like, oh, in theory, I could take any day off. But you never want to take any particular day off because there's always stuff to do when you're self-employed. This is is the downside that we talk about of being self-employed, that it's very hard for the job to leave your mind or for you to leave the job. It's It's always there. There's always stuff that you can do. And... Uh, you know, I I look I look back quite fondly on my time as a teacher when you had those breaks, and there was stuff to do during the breaks. Like I was always working on side projects or whatever, but there was a way that you could genuinely, completely leave the job behind for regular stretches of time, and that was without doubt hugely mentally beneficial to do such a thing. And uh, I particularly love the UK schedule for teachers, which is very different from in America. In America, you usually have like one really big long summer and a few shorter breaks throughout the year. But in the UK, it's like six weeks of teaching and then one week off, six weeks of teaching, two weeks off, six weeks of teaching, one week off. It's just, it's an amazing, amazing schedule that I think I need to move closer 
to that in the future <laughs> because my current schedule of I work almost every day, some amount after probably pretty close to two years of doing that. It's like, no, this needs this needs to change. This is a thing that I need to improve upon. And it is one of the areas in which I have not been so great. Time off isn't just vacations, though. No, it's not just vacations. I'm thinking of vacations because that is the area in which I have been the worst at. Yep. And I'm also thinking about that because... I am. I keep comparing that, oh, this summer would be a lot easier if I could just have it be like my summers were when I was a teacher. That's why I'm thinking about vacations. But I have been much better this past year in particular of making a really conscious effort that no work happens on Saturdays. So I have Saturdays blocked off in my calendar as just no work days. Like nothing's going to happen here. You know, I'm spending time on my own or I'm spending time with my wife, but I'm going to have one really dedicated day out of the week that I know I'm not going to work on that day. And simply doing that has been much more helpful, like to to really treat that day respectfully, like to not just blow it off. And, and it's very easy to do some low level work, but it's like, no, 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 I'm very serious about this. It's Again, it's very funny in this way, like when you are self-employed, you have to be quite disciplined with this kind of stuff like you have to take time off really seriously otherwise you won't do it and that is a thing that has has worked for me but like what is it that you do in in your schedule with regards to time off because you have all of these shows that you record and it seems like you record shows constantly from my perspective i mean do do you have a day in your schedule that is perfectly clear do you do something similar or how does it work for you no Um, (laughs) oh mike well yes and no okay i have no day that is like absolutely no work Mm -hmm. like categorically none weekends are low to none Mm -hmm. and and that is a, a regular thing for me um, there might be some low level work that I do on a Sunday. There might be some like just bits and bobs that pop up that I take care of, mm-hmm. but it's not one or the other for me on weekends, but it tends to be that they are like significantly lower work to the point where it feels like I'm not working. Mm-hmm. Right. But I know there's always stuff going on because our companies are very different. Um, mine runs with people. Right. And some, and I like to be available for people if they need me. So it is a different scenario. It's set up slightly differently. But I'm totally happy with that. I wouldn't want to work any other way. Um, there doesn't have to be any people involved. But, you know, but I wanted there to be. That There there would have been a way to, to run Relay FM very differently than the way that we run it. We didn't have to create a Slack group that had every host in, in it. We just didn't have to do any of that, you know. Because that makes everybody much more available to each other, so it has a lot more requirements to it. But that's the way that I like to run my business. But what I do is, in my theme of the year of less, <laughs> I have uh, two days every two weeks, I mentioned this many times, where there is way less work, mm-hmm. and also one week where there is just less work anyway. Yeah. Like, less shows recording. I, I specifically stack one week heavier than the other, Mm-hmm. And I'm running some side projects through some of that stuff too, but it doesn't feel so much like work, and uh, like you, you know, the way that you do that. And one thing that I'm very mindful of is taking mini breaks throughout the day. That is something that I put a lot of focus on making sure that I do. And working with a predominantly U.S. audience means that's very possible because there are a lot of people that are asleep for the majority of my morning and afternoon. Mm -hmm. So I'm able to do work that is isolated during that time where I'm able to take care of things that people won't bug me for. I'm able to take care of things where I can send stuff to people and they won't get back to me immediately. And then I'm also able to relax a little bit before working again in the evening. Yeah, I think that's I think that's good. And sort of along the same lines where you're talking about mini breaks. One of the behaviors I have been trying to be much more conscious about is deciding when work isn't happening at particular times. And as as I've mentioned before, for me, the afternoons are always my least productive time. And 
while I have been bad about taking a dedicated time off like a vacation, one other thing that I have gotten much, much better at is is really accepting the afternoons as my unproductive time and deciding to not feel the guilt of there are things that you could be working on right now and to say instead, no, I'm, I am accepting that this is low productivity time for me and if in the afternoon I want to sit down and I want to watch a couple episodes of TV or I just want to read a book or something, that is fine because... This is the time of day when it makes most sense to do that, when you'd be the least effective working on something else anyway. And you might as well take this as your downtime. So I try and do this and I do this. I still struggle with it, though. Mm -hmm. And funnily enough, the times where I struggle with it the most are also the times when I need it the most. What do you mean you need it the most? So when when I have a lot on my mind, so when Mm, I have a lot going on... Um, and when I'm very busy, it makes me feel overwhelmed. And when yeah. I feel overwhelmed, I usually need to take more breaks because typically when I have that overwhelmed feeling, it's not as bad as I think it is. And and what will usually happen is Adina will come home mm-hmm. and I will be in a bad mood. Like usually not angry, but upset. Like I feel upset. Grumpy Mike. Grumpy's not even the right word for it. Like mm-hmm. it's a it's a weird feeling mm-hmm. of like maybe more vulnerable. It's a str- it's something that's very difficult for me to explain. But the mm-hmm. only way that I describe it is I will say to her, "I feel overwhelmed," and then she'll say to me, "Tell me all of the things that you have going on," and then I'll list them and realize it's not as many as I think it is. Mm-hmm. This is a very common thing. Maybe happens every few months or so. But it's not something that I can really see until I'm able to express it. But it's funny that like the more and more it happens, the more that I'm realizing that it's in those times is typically where I'm not taking breaks. Mm. And it's when I'm not taking breaks, I'm working maybe a little bit more than I should. And then I feel like there's always more happening than there is. Yeah, that... It's funny you mentioned that because... Uh, just this thing that I do fairly, fairly regularly. I mean, maybe like you, maybe every couple of months. I, I don't know exactly, but uh, I am also aware of that feeling of overwhelmedness. And uh, as I mentioned before, sometimes of like just this feeling like there is so much to do and so little time to do it. I almost feel like that feeling is anti-correlated with actually how many things there are to do uh and and so just the other day again this is now months ago from whenever people are listening (laughs) it may have happened three times between now and then yeah i may have done it several times now but uh just the other day i posted on twitter about how i i always know like oh things are serious when i feel the need to break out a second to do app and so i i am aware like if i have this feeling of overwhelmedness i do the same thing that adina is walking you through of (laughs) let me let me not look at my normal system let me not look at all of my normal things let me just list what are all of the things that are on my mind right now what are all of the things that are top of my mind that's taking up all of this mental attention and what am i feeling overwhelmed about And it's always the same experience of, okay, once I write this down in a list, there may be nine things on that list. But what I often find is, oh, I'm feeling overwhelmed or or busy because a bunch of these things are new or unusual things. It's not that they're actually, I may not actually be tremendously more busy than I, I currently am, but it's just there's uncertainty here. And writing it down on a list like clarifies and refines that uncertainty and helps get rid of that feeling of being too busy and and too overwhelmed. Yeah, there there is something quite funny in there that you talk to a to do app and I talk to my girlfriend. (laughs) I mean, I used to write it down on a piece of paper, but now you know now I I use it to do app for. We're living in the future. Come on. (laughs) Yeah, we're living in the future. Um, (laughs) But yeah, so like having just gone through this. Like this week, I have been feeling very overwhelmed. But when I wrote it all down, what I realized is, okay, I am actually quite busy because this week I 
uh, am working on a video. Uh, we're doing these two podcasts, one which is the bank episode in the future. So that is a thing that counts for me as a bit of a, oh, this is unusual. This is different. Uh, the video that I am working on, again, I can talk about this now, even though it hasn't yet happened, is a collaboration video with somebody else. And so that also adds to the differentness of the project. I like that you said somebody else. You were still trying to guard <laughs> Yeah, I don't know why I did that. From the people that know. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's, just, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a crossover video with Kyrgyzat. I don't know why on earth I said somebody else. Very proud of you right now. <laughs> that was part of my brain being like, I'm not sure if we're supposed to reveal this yet. But no, no one will hear this. But so that's the thing. It's, it's different. And then the other thing is I have a bunch of stuff that's just related to finalizing and preparing for all of the summer travels. Now, that is a busier week than normal, but overwhelmingly the feeling of busyness or the feeling of overwhelmingness is was just coming from a bunch of these things are different than they normally are. And so when you write them all down on a list, you can see, okay, this is clearer than I thought it was before. Yeah. And this helps focus the mind on what you're going to do. And what I also really like about this this process of writing things down in these moments is forcing the list to be in what order are you going to work on it? And you're like this here's the thing at the top, this is the thing that you're doing right now, the next most important thing is below it and then just so on. I I find that is extremely helpful and I don't know. I almost want to use a hippie word like centering. I I don't know. I mm-hmm. I, I it's a similar thing of I have a hard time verbalizing the mental feeling of it's it. It's like decluttering. Yeah, yeah, that's that's actually that's pretty good. That that's a very similar feeling of like a decluttering is. How much stuff is here? Maybe not necessarily a lot, but what you really need to do is get rid of a few items and better arrange the items that you have. And then you realize, "Oh, it wasn't actually that cluttered." But I did need to do a bit of decluttering. That's 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 pretty good. That's pretty good. So going back to the time off part. Mm. So the time off that isn't vacations. You mentioned TV shows. I assume you do video gaming and stuff like that during those periods as well. Yeah, video gaming. It's actually quite recently. It's it's been much more TV than video games. I always tend to go in cycles with video games of so playing a lot and then not playing yeah. very much at all. Yeah, it depends uh, on what whether there's something out that you want to play. Right as well, <laughs> yeah. That's part. That's partly it. But I think it's there's also just something in my brain which is more or less engaged by that activity, and so I think that the it's like the video game TV cycles are are opposite cycles that that go on. So mm-hmm. so yeah, those are the things that I do if if I'm feeling busy or I, I sometimes I feel like there's something that's on my mind in a in a way that is difficult to articulate, and so that's a time when I'll also really like to just go walking around the city. Uh, and just just kind of explore or go to a different place, hmm. kind of chew over something in my mind. I feel like I often don't even know exactly what it is that my brain is thinking about, but going for a long walk can really resolve that kind of stuff. And again, an afternoon is a perfect time for that kind of thing. Like, what else am I going to do? I'm, I'm, I'm not, you know, am I going to record a podcast with Mike? Not every day. We should look into that, though. <laughs> no, we should not. I mean, we've been doing it. <laughs> two days in a row uh-huh. is one day more than enough yeah <laughs> this is supposed to be fortnightly that's what this is supposed to be on this show we spend an awful lot of time talking about side projects as i'm sure many of you out there have them those side projects they need a website those websites need domain names. Hover is the place to buy yours. It's the place that I have bought my domain names from for years because finding the perfect domain is ridiculously easy with Hover. Plus, when all you want to do is just buy that domain name or email address, you shouldn't have to opt out of page after page of add-ons of stuff you don't want to have to deal with and stuff you're not interested in. That's why Hover only offers domains and email so you can focus on finding that great domain name and just get back to working on your great side project or idea they also believe that you shouldn't have to pay for things that should already be included with your domain most people don't realize that when you register a domain name your contact information including your email address phone number and home address is published online for marketers spammers and hackers to find what's called a who is database unlike most other domain providers hover includes free who is privacy with all supported domains to keep your information confidential 
Find the perfect domain name for your idea. Go to hover.com and use the promo code Year of Less at checkout to save 10% off your first purchase. Thank you so much to Hover for their support of this show and Relay FM. But what about you, Mike? Like for your time off, because I, I always just think about your schedule. Like you have this crazy schedule that I think I could not live with. And it seems like your day is just very fragmented. Yeah. So so like, w- like what does that look like for you? It has been a real problem for me this week. Mm-hmm. Yesterday, I had a feeling, which I do not have very often, mm-hmm. boredom. Hmm. So yesterday morning, I was very bored. And when I started thinking about it, what I realized is I haven't been outside of the house mm. in five days. <laughs> yeah. Previously uh-huh. to that, I was in a relative's house for the day. Mm-hmm. And then before that, I was home for four days. Mm -hmm. So what I realized is really I haven't left the house in two weeks because the times that I left the house, I was going to other houses. (laughs) You've been a house cat for two weeks. Exactly. And this is where my... There are two factors here that make this difficult, which is schedule and location. Mm -hmm. Now... I was talking to Adina about this and she was saying, just go for a walk. And But the walk is not the thing that I need. It's not being, being out of the house is not what I need. It's stimulation when I leave the house. Mm-hmm. And just leaving here and walking around my outer rim planet right. is no good for me. Yeah, you just got cattle skulls to yeah. kick over. You just tumbleweed. I could chase the tumbleweed down the street, but right. that's not going to do much good. There's not really any benefit to me that I feel for doing that, you know, mm-hmm. other than the exercise. I do exercise at home. Don't mm-hmm. worry, I'm not turning into a blob here. So this is like an issue that I have had mainly because the last two weeks have been uncharacteristically busy because of upcoming travel. So it's one of the reasons why the uh, year of less quiet week, which I'm currently in, has mm-hmm. actually been busier than my previous busy week because there is travel coming up. And I presume that this means you are, like you're doing with me right now, recording other shows in advance or getting yeah. getting ready in some way for a a content drought while you are at WWDC and not going to be recording a ton of stuff. Exactly. <laughs> and also... Uh, other people like other co-hosts and stuff are moving around a lot so there's like just a lot of like things moving around on my schedule we've had new things that we're trying to get ready to do and all that sort of stuff so there's like additional pressures that maybe wouldn't be here usually Mm -hmm. and the other part that you mentioned my schedule combined with the fact that i am kind of on the outer rim my schedule will throw things in the middle of the day yeah yeah so we record at two o'clock Um, I record some other shows at three o'clock. So Mm -hmm. once I'm done with my morning work, I can't really go anywhere Mm -hmm. because I wouldn't make it back in time because I'm like an hour away from anything I want to do. Right. So this is where the location is a problem, which is why, you know, when we move, which is getting closer and closer, one of the key things that we're looking for is to be in civilization of some kind. So I won't have to have this feeling because I can just go take a walk and maybe go get a coffee in a different location or take a nice walk around a nice place, do a thing, go to the store. You know, I can do all of these things and they'll be more pleasant for me. Mm -hmm. But the good thing is I don't feel like this very frequently because I do make an effort in usual times to plan things outside of the home, going to visit people, having lunches with people and stuff like that. But it was very interesting to me to confirm what I expected would be the case, which is if I stay in the house too long, I would get the boredom feeling. But it is funny that it's maybe the first time I have felt this in the two years that I've been self-employed. Hmm. Yeah, it's it's a funny thing because boredom is a feeling for children... And for office monkeys. That's where that feeling seems like it would be the most present in the population. And to be self-employed, there's always something to do. Like, I I think boredom... I caught myself feeling slightly bored a few weeks ago. 
And I just, I noticed it as a bizarre feeling like, oh, I haven't felt this way in forever. I haven't felt this way in a really long time. Yeah, that's how I thought. I was like, I put my iPad down and I went, Phew. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> like patting your legs with your hands yeah, and just like, looking around. There's nothing to do. There's nothing on my to-do list. I have something later on, but nothing to do right now. I've already watched all my YouTube videos. I've already mm. completed Uncharted. There's nothing to do. Yeah. <laughs> this, like, like my summer planning, like some of the other stuff we're talking about now, I feel like this is all falling into the category of this meta skill of observing yourself. Yeah. And it is a really key skill to, in those moments, take note of your own mental state and what's occurring. And that, I don't know, I think that that's, sounds kind of obvious, but I really think this is a learned skill to cognitively learn to watch yourself and then walk yourself through precisely what you're talking about here, thinking like, why do I feel bored? And, tr- and tracking it back, as opposed to just accepting that boredom is a feeling that you occasionally experience and projecting outward, like, oh, my media is not entertaining enough for me right now. That's why I'm being bored. It's like, no, 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 no. That's that's not what it is. There's some There's something that you are doing that is causing this in yourself. And so then you recognize, like, oh, I have been a house cat for 14 days in a row. That's yep. why I'm feeling bored. Yep. Uh, there's there has been no external stimulation. Everything is just the same, or everything is just media consumption. But I think it's really key to be able to recognize that in yourself, and then be able to try to course correct and and act on that. I was also quite pleased because it proved a hypothesis that I had about myself. You know, and I was able. To, I was I was happy in the sense that I was able to understand that this could happen, and then mm-hmm. when it did happen, I recognized it. Right. And it also just makes me very uh, wary of allowing it to happen, which is why, you know, as the, as we get closer and closer to the end of the year, I mean, we're still halfway through the year, but, we, you know, we're about to be on the other end of the middle, right? Mm-hmm. So we're moving towards the end of the year. I'm beginning already to think about what does 2017 look like commitments-wise. <laughs> See, this is... <sighs> <laughs> this is this is perfect because this is exactly what I've been thinking about so intensely in in the past several weeks as well. Is <laughs> almost mentally like, well, the rest of the year is is kind of set. Yeah, I'm not going to make any changes now. Yeah, I might do new stuff, but I'm not going to get rid of anything because it's all planned. It's all there. It all exists. We all accept it. But, yeah, there's a, there's a schedule in place. Yep. But already thinking forward towards next year and like what what does next year look like and doing the same thing on a bigger scale of what has this year looked like? What does last year look like? What do you again, like along with the metacognition, this this feeling of of the the project of a human life is to design a life that it wants to live. Like this this is the ultimate thing that you want to try to do is is Make your life more of a life that you want to live. And so doing the same thing of thinking forward to 2017 and thinking, okay, how can 2017 be better than 2016? What structural changes are there that can be made in the future that will place me in a situation where I like my life even better than I already like it? Right? This is one of these things that you kind of naturally end up thinking about but it's it's just funny that you say that you again at this point which is essentially not yet but barely halfway through the year you already are quite naturally thinking forward toward next year like that's just something that's that's coming across your mental horizon i think it's you know a lot of it is because by this point in the year i at least have accumulated some new things and i want to work on some new stuff so I'm like, okay, you're at the halfway point now, and how are you feeling? Okay, mm-hmm. you're starting to feel like maybe you've got a lot going on, but oh wait, you're not stopping. Mm-hmm. So it's just a case of over the hump, time to consider what next year looks like. And mm-hmm. if, it's just like, you know how we were talking in January about New Year being time to reflect? Mm-hmm. I feel like in the same vein, half year is just in the time to start making yourself aware of next year yeah it's just like a little mental clock thing that happens where i'm like okay i've been doing this what i set out in january for six months now 
now it's time to start preparing myself for what the next part looks like. I should, by this point in the year, have worked out if the 2016 plan was an effective one. Mm -hmm. And now how do I tweak it to create the 2017 plan? Right. And the the rest of 2016 is, in some sense, execution on the, the what has already been set up. Yep. Right. It's like we're just going to continue to execute what has been set up and then thinking thinking forward toward the next year. Yeah. There's no point for course correction in, in, unless there's something significantly wrong, mm-hmm. which there isn't. I mean, you know, you're course correcting in some way in that you're getting help. Yes, that's true. Although I will still say that all of this is falling under the year of less. Like yeah, this for, is, for this sure. Is, this is why that project was set up for this year. And to to go even on a on a like zoom out one additional level is another part of the motivation behind the year of less was also also relates to what we were discussing before, which is recognizing I have been really bad at taking vacation time for myself and the last vacation time that I, that I theoretically had over the summer, I was not very good at doing that. I was bad at vacationing. Uh, hmm. And so the year of less is in a larger part of way of thinking of, okay, well, how can I set up structures so that it is easier for me to take some dedicated amount of time off? Right. And, and, but that, but even that is like, okay, I need to get those systems in place in 2016 if there is any hope of rearranging schedules or commitments in 2017. Uh, it's just, it's funny to think of these things on such a long term. But if you don't think about this stuff, you can't do any kind of course correction in no. your life. And everything always takes longer than you think it's, it's going to. So that's why it can take a whole year to think about how can I reduce the number of hours that I am working on stuff while not dramatically reducing the actual output. And then if that is successful, that can have knock-on effects towards what happens in, in the future. Do you have anything that you want to reveal about your 2017, Mike? Any secret plans you want to tell the people about? I don't have secret plans yet. <laughs> So what are you thinking about then towards 2017? Like what what is pulling your mind in that direction? It was the same thing as last year. Um, so the the 2016 change was cutting a show and reducing the schedule of some others. Mm-hmm. So it will be the same kind of thing, I expect. Like that's what I'm thinking now is like, okay, that worked pretty well. What can I do? So are there any shows which would be natural to end at the end of mm-hmm. the year? Um, and are there any shows which would be natural to reduce commitment in some way? Maybe mm-hmm. um, I don't change the, the publishing schedule of them, but maybe there are parts of the process which I won't, need, I won't do anymore, mm-hmm. whether that is planning it differently or editing it differently. Um, what are the, the changes that I can make to reduce... And this is the thing. It's not for me about reducing the amount of work. It's freeing up time again. Mm-hmm. So I'm not looking to like do less and chill. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm not getting into the gray mentality of just <laughs> just chill. Uh, I'm looking to reduce commitments so I can do new things. Because mm. I like working. I like it a lot. Um, and and a lot of the time off stuff that I do is to enable myself to be able to work more effectively because I give myself the time to relax because I know that that helps me. But in the same vein, I also then try and find ways, and I don't know if this is good or bad, to turn the things that I enjoy into work. (laughs) So it all comes full circle. It doesn't stop my enjoyment of those things. I still play video games for 12 hours, but then I just do a, a, a podcast episode about it and it feels like it was all okay. Right, you're getting return on investment for uh-huh. your entertainment time there. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, well, this I think this is this is a very natural thing, and my version of this as well is is like I am I know that I am happier with side projects and other things to work on aside from the main things, and it's a similar thing of feeling that. I want to be able to clear time on my schedule. And part of that means like, you know, I always have like projects that I'm thinking about, oh, maybe this would work out. Maybe this, this would work out. And I am filtering them all now through the year of less 
filter that if they're successful, other people need to be able to do them or need to be able to pass them on or they need to be completed things. Again, I'm very happy to have that men- mental filter in place, but I'm still very much in the mindset of as well, freeing up time and very consciously not working on any of those side projects until I have freed up a significant number of hours. But then the thing that I'm also wondering about is I agree with you that, that vacation time is necessary recovery time and recognizing like I haven't been good at that. And so feeling Is there a way to aggregate a bunch of these hours together so that in the future at some point I can say, I am taking a legitimate 100% week off. I am doing nothing and I am going to feel glorious about it and that will be okay. And then after that recovery period going back into the regular schedule. Because even though, again, our very first episode was titled, I don't really like work, uh... (laughs) I am very aware that I am still in the category of the kind of person who, if I don't have something to work on, I would go crazy. Like, I I need to have some kind of work to do. And without that, it would just be a descent into madness. <laughs> so there always has to be stuff to work on. But there's the interesting question of how do you rearrange hours in the day? How do you how do you arrange your time to be most effective so that you can work on the things that are of interest to you and that are also hopefully profitable in some way to pay the bills and to fulfill all of the various financial obligations that we all have? What is a gray vacation or a graycation, if you will? I mean, here, here's the thing. Those trips to Amsterdam, which we have made fun of various times on this mm-hmm. show... Workations. Yeah, those were, in a way, my attempts this year to try to do a vacation, sort of. But I knew I I wasn't able to actually take time off to do nothing. But I, I found those very interesting experiences because I was working in a very, very focused way. But I also felt like I am getting a lot of the same benefits that I would get from a vacation. And I think this is this is just simply the, again, knowing yourself and knowing how to work with yourself. And because I am quite naturally an, an introverted person, those trips were intentionally arranged so that like I'm not really talking to anybody when I'm there. And I was also very consciously minimizing as much as possible my communication with the outside world. And so those were really interesting experiences to me of, I feel like I am able to have some kind of recovery while still working. Mm -hmm. As long as I am very conscious about being aware of what are the things that are most draining to me. And it's like, Oh, okay. Well, one of those things are unusual or new social engagements. Or or, thing, or things like the podcast where this is not an unusual or new social engagement, but there is there is something about this which is always a bit mentally draining in the same way because there is the awareness of the audience that is listening. Like this is a thing that is going out into the public world. This is not Mike and I just meeting for a lunch conversation. So those trips are really interesting and I think... Oftentimes, many people's idea of what a vacation might be, where it's like, oh, well, we're going to go away with a bunch of people to a fun place. Like, that can actually be hugely draining for me. <laughs> like, that is, what's, that is what is going to happen this summer in no small part with some of the family obligations that I have is to any outside observer, the, the activities that I am doing, they will look like vacations, but I will be totally <laughs> exhausted by them. It's like, oh, I don't, I'm not doing a whole lot of work. There's just a whole bunch of hanging out with people and like, oh, there's things to do and activities to participate in. And this looks like a vacation, but it is not. It is not if you are me. <laughs> uh, so I, I think for me, vacations at their best are always about limits in activity or or very conscious choices about what is being engaged in that 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 to me is what a vacation is that is what i feel like is the the best return on investment per hour spent of recovery received so is amsterdam the best 
type of vacation then, or is it sitting on a beach for you? Or that kind of holiday, the not doing anything holiday. What's best then if if it's like low low social interaction um, and low work interaction is, you know, because Amsterdam is high work interaction. Yeah. I, I, this is this is what I'm trying to think about towards towards for next year is like, h- how am I going to do this? And one of the things I'm thinking about is an Amsterdam type trip is very effective because it is it is high work, but s- low social interaction, high recovery. But I still need trips or vacations every once in a while that have some period of time which is just absolute nothingness. And so uh, last summer, which was which was quite busy, at the end of the trip, the best decision that my wife and I made was that af- after a whole bunch of things that we were doing and places we were going and like things to do, we intentionally scheduled a mini post-vacation recovery time by going to Las Vegas. And we just rented a, a nice room in Las Vegas and did nothing for a few days and it was just glorious. And and that was a real kind of like this is this is great. I can I can relax. I can just there's nothing to do. I need this every once in a while of of there's no responsibility. There's no getting up, there's no writing. It's just a total break. And because that is a thing that went really well last summer, that is actually what we're planning on doing again this summer. It's like I have this incredibly unusual busy summer. Uh, but at the very end of it, the last thing that we're going to do is we are, uh, once again, we're going to go to Las Vegas. We're renting a nice room. We're going to spend a few days there and we're just going to do nothing. And I feel like I need I need a little bit more of the do nothing at all time in my life uh, than I currently have. Like I, f- I feel over the past two years in particular, I have had too little do nothing time. I don't need a ton of it but i need some of it on a on a on a some somewhat of an interval that it doesn't just randomly it doesn't just randomly occur but now this is one of these cases where i imagine mike that you might be a little bit different from me in this scenario what's a what's a mike cation like well i recently most of my vacations are centered around conferences Mm -hmm. And it's because I take my vacations as times to see my friends because Mm. very few of my friends live in the same country as me. Right. Um, You do, which is great, which means I see you often. Mm -hmm. Uh, Other friends I maybe see once a year (laughs) or twice a year, something like that. So I'm able to couple these things in because they're also like interesting locations i very much like going to america and it's usually nice places in america that i'll go to for this sort of stuff and they are kind of workcations because there are worky type things happening Mm. but it's way lower i tend not to record on these things if i do it's very few Um, i've tried like san francisco last year wwc last year was quite a lot of uh show recordings and other things happening and uh this year was planned very differently to hopefully maybe it did who knows it's already happened but maybe it was better maybe it wasn't (laughs) we'll find out and adjust again uh recording with you was an unexpected thing on the calendar hi hey ho that's how these things go It's, Mm -hmm. it's all about um cooperation and i do like though the do nothing vacation i just don't really plan for those as much Mm. Um, because one of the things that has occurred is uh, me and Adina like to make sure we try and take trips together uh, which typically means that she will take a trip with me to a friend's location in America Mm -hmm. centered around a thing happening and then maybe I will take trips with her to Romania and we'll see friends Um, but you know we are uh, thinking again for later this year to maybe take a trip with my family which will Mm -hmm. be a do nothing vacation Mm -hmm. because i feel like i could do that like when i take family vacations or have taken or would take family vacations i would feel way less obligated to like do stuff 
with my family Mm -hmm. than maybe you do. I feel like there is an obligation within you to when you are on a family vacation, family activities. Uh, (laughs) I don't really do that. And my family understand that about me, which is actually quite interesting now going talking about this is I may be more you with my family than you are. Yeah, with my immediate family, there is no obligation to really do things. Aha. Uh-huh. I have a very small family, you see. So I think that's why I'm able to get away with it. But mm-hmm. people tend not to bother me in my family with stuff because they know I just have no tolerance for it. Which is quite nice. <laughs> so on a family vacation, I wouldn't do anything like that. And if we don't do that trip, I would very much, before the end of the year, like for us to do a do-nothing vacation. The house buying mm. process might kind of get in the way of that. Um, but yeah, I, I like to try and do that as well. But the majority of my vacations are centered around some kind of big activity that brings people together. Yeah. For me, an interesting intersection of sort of doing nothing but also engaging was a, a few years ago, my parents treated my wife and I to a cruise. So the four of us went on a cruise and it was just fantastic because a cruise ship is an environment in which while there are many things going on, I again really enjoyed the constraint of it. It's like, well, there's not actually a whole lot to do. Uh, You know, there's, the internet is unusable uh, because it's going through a satellite. And it's like, oh, actually, that's a benefit. I like this. There's there's not really any internet to use. There's very little to do except kind of like sit and read a book and watch the scenery go by. And a cruise ship is also a, a nice environment where it's like, oh, because it's relatively small. Like you keep bumping into my parents Right. You can't you can't not run into people. And it's it's like an artificial tiny village almost. Ooh, yeah, yeah. 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 In, in this really constrained but enjoyable way. And there's always something to like remark upon because the cruise ship is going past interesting places. And I, don't know, I just I found that was just a, a really pleasant way to have a trip that just totally felt like recovery time, but also had the thing that is beneficial and best about traveling, which is novelty. Like your brain needs some kind of novelty. Uh, Otherwise you become like Mike was, you're bored or you feel like you're an indoor cat. And I I don't know. I, I found that was just a really great, interaction like this is this is this is just perfect (laughs) this is an absolutely perfect experience this episode of cortex is brought to you by squarespace the simplest way for anyone to create a beautiful landing page website or online store start building your website today at squarespace.com and use the offer code cortex at checkout to get 10 percent off your first purchase with the easy to use tools and templates squarespace helps you capture every detail of what drives you because if it's worth the effort it's worth sharing with the world when you have that push, that pull, that shove for the great idea or service or thing that you're looking to build, create, and maybe turn into something that could be your next project. Squarespace is the place you should look for to find all of the tools that you need to build a professionally designed website regardless of your skill level, with no coding experience required. Squarespace have state-of-the-art technology to power your site, ensure security and stability, and give you all of the tools that you need to make it look and feel exactly how you want. That is why Squarespace are trusted by millions of people all around the world. All of their sites feature responsive design. Their templates are fantastic and they make your site look great on all sizes of device. They have 24-7 support. They have a commerce platform, so you can sell things with your Squarespace site. They have cover pages, rock-solid fast hosting, and so much more. It doesn't matter how much experience you've had with building websites in the past. You can have none, or you can have a lot. Squarespace can cater for everything, because not only do they have their great drag-and-drop tools for those of us who don't know how to code HTML and CSS, they also have their dev platform which allows you to get in and tinker with the code under the hood 
if that's your bag. Squarespace plans start at just $8 a month and you can sign up for a free trial with no credit card required and start building your own website today by going to squarespace.com. When you decide to sign up, make sure that you use the offer code Cortex at checkout to get 10% off your first purchase and show your support for this show. Thank you to Squarespace for supporting Cortex and Relay FM. I feel like we've been really philosophical on this episode, Mike. Mm-hmm. This episode... Being an episode out of time, it has a totally different feel to it. Do you feel that? It is weird, right? I feel way more raw than usual. (laughs) Yeah. The word that I'm looking for. It's very strange. It is. Raw is a good word. Maybe the continuity somehow keeps us safe. Maybe. When we're out of continuity, everything just goes out the window. Yeah. It, It almost feels like I'm just, I'm here in my office just floating in the black void of space talking Mm -hmm. into a microphone that that is the feeling of this episode it is weird from my perspective because i don't we have so much uncertainty to it yeah what will have happened to our lives in between now and this episode being released we don't even know yeah who knows who knows nobody knows it's just been it's been very strange this episode out of time and i think I think we need to try to try to get ourselves back into the regular space-time continuum with some normality. And I think we should do that with a little bit of Ask Cortex. That's a great idea. Let's bring the people back to us. Yeah, yeah, that's what it is. This is like calling out in the void <laughs> to the other voices that have spoken to us. Please tell me that you have some Ask Cortex questions in I your do. document. Okay. I do. And the first Good. one's from Kevin. Oh, look at that. Your voice is even normal now, right? I'm so because happy again. <laughs> it's the normal mic voice. Okay. Kevin would like to know, what is your relationship with Magic the Gathering? Uh, <laughs> apparently, Kevin has recognized some references in the video and was wondering if you have played and if you do play. Do you know what Ma- Magic the Gathering is, Mike? I know what it is, yes. Yeah, okay. a, a trading card game. Okay, yeah. Yeah, Magic is a trading card game it is I, I, i'm i'm not it is one of the first i ever came across i don't know how early it is in the history of these actual things of collectible card game i feel kind like of it stuff. is the one though right like it is the trading card game it feels like the progenitor of the modern idea yeah. of what trading card games are uh and I um, I got into Magic when I was in high school, I think. I can't remember how, but it was it was right at the very beginning because I remember reading some article in some physical magazine that was talking about this new thing, and I thought it looked cool. And I remember bugging my parents to take me to some game shop so that I could buy these cards. Mm-hmm. And... Of course, I didn't realize that these card games are set up to be like drug habits that you, right, you, you can get in really easy, right? You can, you can start out by just, oh, here you go. You buy yourself a starter deck. And then, oh, may, hey, maybe, kid, do you want to buy some expansion packs? And it's like, oh, yeah, I would like to buy some expansion packs. And then next year, they come out with the more powerful version of the drug. And so you have to buy more expansion packs if you want to, if you want to, keep up with what's happening in the game and i really liked it uh magic just super fit the kind of thing that my brain likes thinking about all of the different cards and how all of the cards interact with all of the other cards and the systems of it i i really really liked it uh but i did not have a large enough wallet at the time to express how much i liked magic and so my, my feeling of magic from, from being a kid was mostly, I do not have enough money to play this game. I always have to play it with whatever cards I have just scrounged together. Uh, so I, I really I really liked it a lot as a kid. As an adult, I have played some of the iPad versions of it because that's a much cheaper way to get into the game. I'm not super into it as an adult in no small part because there have been so many expansions and so many add-ons that the game is horrifically complicated now if you haven't been following it every year with all the little changes that they make uh but yeah magic the gathering quite like it got into it as a kid 
And if I can make a 15 years out of date Magic the Gathering reference in my videos, I'm not going to pass up on that. Have you ever played Hearthstone? <sighs> Hearthstone is really fun. Have you played Hearthstone? Yeah, I I have played and sucked so bad. <laughs> Listen, there's never a discussion about how good we are at these things. It's just a question of have you played? Yeah, I have played. Hearth- Hearthstone is, for listeners, it's... To me, it feels like the next generation of Magic the Gathering. It's it's all on the iPad. Or on desktop. It's, it's cross-platform. Yeah, or on, I always forget that it's on desktop. Yeah. It's a collectible card game, but what I love about it is they so understand that nobody has physical cards here. It is the abstract idea of a card, and it allows them to do a lot of really interesting things digitally with the game. Uh, Hearthstone is a thing that I, I slide in and out of, but I, I think it's it's really fun. But Hearthstone totally killed my ability to play Magic because all of the things that you learn in Magic that make you a good Magic player, I think Hearthstone was designed specifically so that all of your Magic habits will just be like sliding a knife into your own gut when you play mm. the game. If you play, if it's like, oh, I love, I love Magic-based card games, let me play Hearthstone. And it's like, oh, I'm going to die immediately. Everything that I would do in Magic, which would be a smart, a smart strategic move, will get you killed immediately in Hearthstone. Uh, so I, I think I'm probably never going to go back to playing Magic because once you do Hearthstone, it's it's hard to go back. But it's super fun. I, I really like it. Uh, and I it's fun to play people anonymously online. Uh, again, I'm not very good at all, but I don't care. Like, that's not the point is to be good. The point is oh, I'm doing something fun while I'm sitting on the couch. The only trading card game, physical trading card game I've ever played was the Pokemon trading card game. Of course. Which was course. awesome. They Kinda even made a Game Boy version of the card game, which was great, too. The Pokemon trading card game, huh? Yep. It's still going. It's still a, a very popular trading card game. They're still making it. They're still producing packs and stuff like that. Yeah, I, I used to play it with my friends You know, during the whole massive Pokemon phase. Mm-hmm. And yes, yeah, so that's the only one I've ever played. But I remember when I would buy my packs that Magic were always in the same cases from the places that I bought them from. Yeah. That's how I know about Magic, because <laughs> it was always there when I was buying the booster packs for the Pokemon. Mm. I'm, just, I'm just looking at it, yeah. That's man, cool. you got to get that shiny Charizard. That was the card, man. <laughs> that was the card. Oh, I, of course. I just realized everyone will want to know. All the Magic players will want to know. Uh, when I played Magic, my preferred colors were blue and black. So, yeah. Fun memories. Do you play the Pokemon game very much anymore? No, I, I don't even have any cards anymore. Like, I don't know where they are. I had a big collection of cards. I used to love it. I still have a box of Magic cards at my parents' house that they have in a box of a bunch of like stuff from when I was a kid. I expect all of my Pokemon cards are at my grandma's. Uh, I find it really hard not to look through them when yeah. I remember that they exist. Like I just, I pull them out and I look at them and I'm like, yes, I remember setting up this deck. Like, yes, this was an, this was a really fun deck. Like, Oh, this was a l- good combination. It's like, it's just a thing that my mind likes to turn over and over. <laughs> you can't escape some of that stuff. Now, I have a question that I've been wanting to ask you just because it's going to be so difficult to ask the question. Uh, oh, okay. So this comes from Alan. And Alan says, when Gray uses this face, then inserts a character, where does that face come from? Do you have it locally and copy and paste it, or do you Google it every time? Now, how would you describe the face character that Alan has... You just sent it to me over iMessage. How would you describe this face character? What is this? This is the face of disapproval. Mm -hmm. That's what this face is. Now, it's not an emoji, right? It is text-based. It's more, I guess... It's not an emoji. It's an old-school emoticon. Yeah. Back in the day, we used to build our little facial expressions out of the characters that we had available. You're not that much older than me. I used to do this. We didn't have people just drawing emoji for us. We had to build them with our own hands, Mike. Artisanally created uh, emoticons. Right? <laughs> of course, of Handmade. course, a hipster would think uh, you're right to artisanal. <laughs> no, <laughs> we're not artisanal. We're just chiseling them out of characters. What is this? Is it? Is it got a name that you know? 
I think it's just called the 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 disapproval phase. I'm going to check it right now. So where does it come from for you when you use it? Do you have like a text expander snippet or something? Uh, its official name is called the look of disapproval. Mm. <laughs> and if it'll be in it'll be in the show notes, anybody who has ever been on Reddit will know exactly what we're talking about. Yep. But yes, it is it is this stern looking emoticon face with a little horizontal mouth. And I think they're tie symbols or something, which are the eyes, but that end up just looking like eyes that are staring into your soul with furrowed brows. Uh, but yeah, I came, I came across this on Reddit, you know, ages and ages ago. And I think that it is just an absolute perfect emoticon for very many situations. And so I have it set up as one of those, uh, the sinking keyboard shortcuts that uh-huh. Apple has. Yes. So I can I can whip it out at the appropriate moment immediately. Uh, so what do I type? I don't even know. Like it's just built into my. Now now that I'm thinking about it, I've, you can't I can't do don't... it. What, okay, what do I type? I type I type D I S Q, and that is my little shortcut for disapproval phase. Mm-hmm. And so the the moment that I need to over the internet glare at someone with a disapproving face, I have it right at my fingertips. Rumor 33 asked, are there any side projects that Gray wishes would have been the big thing to take off instead of YouTube? That's an interesting question. The, the thing that's, that's tricky to answer about that is to express appropriately my feelings towards all of the projects that I've worked on. And my, my feelings of them is I love them as much as they have been successful. And so, like, I, I really like the YouTube project because it has been really successful. And I, I don't have a feeling toward any of the past projects of, oh, I wish this one had been the one to catch on. It's more a feeling of like, oh, I worked on this thing for a while and it didn't really go anywhere. And then I moved on to the next thing. And so, no, I, I, don't, I don't look backward on it in, mm-hmm. in that way. It... it, it I, I I don't know if this is the best analogy, but I always think of it as like placing bets on a table. And so so this question is almost like asking, do you wish that any of the bets that you had previously made had paid off? It's like, well, I think you're thinking about this in the wrong way. If you know, you're placing a bunch of bets and you're hoping that some of them are successful and then you are happy when one of them turns out to be successful. But you don't you don't think about like oh that black thirty two six weeks ago I really wish that had been the one like it's it's much more of a like a system than it is a series of events that's that's kind of the way I think about it yeah because it was always about which one would be the one to provide the the result you were looking for right which was to be able to control my own schedule and yep. and work on my own right like that was the thing that I was aiming for and the various projects were different attempts to to try and get there. Like I did, you know, maybe we, maybe we can talk about it in more detail on, on some future or maybe past show. I don't know. Maybe we will have spoken about it. <laughs> uh, but I think the, the the closest thing that to that is a feeling of it, it was actually frustrating more for some of the projects that were partially paying off because I feel like th- those were things that, sucked up a lot of my time because it felt like oh man if i can make this a little bigger this will be great and so in some sense i preferred the things that i worked on that were immediately obviously terrible ideas or or that just didn't work whereas i had for a while there i had a few things that i was working on where it's like i'm earning a little bit of money from this and i'm earning a little bit of money from that and i had this just this very frustrating feeling of like i like can i just cobble this together or can i make this twice as big uh and so those in a sense were bets that in a way were like more unsuccessful than my just straight up unsuccessful bets because they were not winners and they also took up a bunch of my time all right tobias wants to know if we make our beds every morning i already know from surprising you on facetime that one time i should have seen this coming that you do not make your bed every morning i don't make my bed every morning one of the great pleasures in my life is the fact that it doesn't bother my girlfriend about 
if our bed is made. <laughs> you are a lucky man, then. <laughs> Neither of us seem to care about it. Every now and then we'll do it, but, like, hang on a second. Yeah, no, it's an absolute disaster right now. <laughs> it's right behind you right now. <laughs> it's right behind me right now. And we're both pretty cool about that, I think. Maybe she's, I don't know, harboring some kind of resentment towards me that I'm not aware of yet. Quite possibly. Um, it's, I, yeah, it's very possible. I think everyone in my life has some kind of resentment towards me. Um, yeah. yeah, I've got some data that says so. <laughs> uh, but no, I don't make my bed every morning. Um, I bet you do. So I, I used to not, because I used to fall under the category of, well, what does this matter? I'm just going to mess it up later anyway. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I think that is, that is a totally reasonable position. But I can't remember where I came across it, but at, at some point I came across on a podcast or some something, someone was really selling the idea of you need to make your bed every morning. And I'm always open to trying stuff. Like, I can't remember what they said, but whatever they said, it, I felt like it was convincing. And so I went through a period where I was going through an effort of making sure that the bed was made every morning. I was like, oh, this does seem to have intangible benefits that I cannot quite quantify that do make making the bed worthwhile. It's, again, hard to put into words, but it it feels like it is definitely something. And so... I now do try to make the bed in the morning if it is unmade. There's a there's a little bit of a there's a little bit of a thing here with the morning schedule that I am usually up and out of the house before my wife is even awake. And then it depends on like she has varying schedules about when she needs to be someplace in the morning. So sometimes she makes the bed, sometimes she doesn't have time. And if I come home and I see the bed is unmade, I will sometimes try to make it. Like but I don't know like randomly sometimes the bed will be made or sometimes it'll be unmade. But the thing that my wife has noticed is that I am not perfectly consistent about making the bed in a way that I don't notice, but of course she is aware and she is able to use the madeness of the bed as a proxy for how on top of his life does my husband feel? Mm, right? Canary so, in the coal mine right there, my friend. That's exactly it. So I don't know, maybe, maybe intentionally she leaves the bed unmade sometimes as like a little test to see is he feeling really busy and overwhelmed right now? So overwhelmed that he's not going to make the bed or is he feeling totally on top of things? I guess I'll know when I'll come home. Maybe that's what she does. I don't know. Gray. Yeah. It's a trap. <laughs>